open up our worship service, asking the Lord to come by here.
Hallelujah. We want you to come by here. Thank you, Jesus. And we learned from this morning that if we call on that name of Jesus, from going down in the water to coming back out of the water, he's still here. Those are the unspoken prayer requests. Come by here, Lord, acknowledged by the raising of our hands. Oh, Lord, Father God, we thank you once again for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your tender and unfailing love. We thank you for mercies that's just been renewed again. Songwriter said you woke, up, you woke us up this morning with our minds stayed on Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity again when we think of the goodness of Jesus. And all that you've done for us, soul cries out, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you for saving. We thank you for keeping. We thank you for yet again that we can come boldly to your throne, that you've chosen to think the very best of us. Oh, Lord, thank you for an opportunity to worship you. And as we learn and as we realize, as your word says, we've learned to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for the truth, Lord. Thank you for being called by that mighty name. His name is Jesus. Oh, God, in Jesus' name, actuate our being this morning and, out, and motivate our thoughts. Put us on one mind and one accord for, oh, how good, oh, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Stir up the gift within us, oh, God. Help us, oh, God, from the inside out to give you all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. For thou art our strength, thou art our refuge, and a very present help in the time of trouble uh, while the world turns its back on you uh, while the world looks away from you lord we lift our eyes to thy holy hill from whence cometh our help uh, our help cometh from the lord now move in around and about us lord let your name be lifted up that someone would say what must i do to be saved bless those that are listening electronically lord we turn the service into thy hands that you might have the preeminence Bless your word this afternoon, and we won't fail to give you all the honor, all the praise. We're here to give your name all the glory, for to ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us remain standing at this time for our responsive reading. Praise the Lord. Our responsive reading will be taken from Acts, the second chapter, verse 36 through 42. That's Acts, the second chapter, verse 36 through 42. Speaking on truth. 36 read. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. All together. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. May the Lord had a blessing to the reading of his word. Praise the Lord. Thank God for making it through another week. Thank God for keeping us at this time. If we have any first time visitors, we ask that you stand.
so that we can acknowledge you. I see a couple of new faces in here. I'd like to welcome you at this time. Please stand. Amen. Happy to have you with us. Um, pray that you enjoy the service and that we'll see you again. God bless you. Also like to welcome those who are watching us on live stream. Welcome to Redemption Church of Christ. And just a reminder that we do record our services for our radio broadcast stations. So we ask that you silence your cell phones at this time and minimize walking and talking during the word of God. Today, in addition to our regular offering, we'll be taking up our church expense fund. And at this time, we're going to prepare for our regular offering. We ask that both sides please rise, face the center aisle, and follow the directions of the center aisle usher.
Come on, God's ready to move. Come on and praise the Lord, everybody. You know what happens? You know, during the winter, we're happy now. It's getting a little bit warmer. But during the winter, you go outside, like, and you're always cold out. This, but you begin to shiver and you say, I need a jacket. I need something warm. And, and see, when you, when you feel God, see, when God shows up, it's not a regular. See, we heard that message on this morning. And we just sung the song, God's not dead. If you feel him, the Bible says the redeemed of the Lord ought to say so. But I feel him in my hands. I feel him in my feet. I feel him. Hey, glory. You see, the thing about a feeling is, only you can feel it. Only you can feel it. Jesus on the inside. Hey! How do you feel? Can nobody do you like... Now we say the same, how did you feel when you came out of the wilderness? How did you feel making it through another week? you know about Jesus? Now, now, I'm asking you a serious question. Tell me what you know about Jesus. Now, tell me, how do you feel about Jesus? Anybody get joy when they think about him? Come on now, we thought that, that was a marvelous message on this morning in Sunday school. Anybody know that name of Jesus? Hey, come on now, I'm talking to a church here. I need some folk to say some amen. I need some folk. And people have been talking about their vaccination shots and their one and two shots, but something about that name of Jesus. If anybody call on that name and you begin to feel something, some current in your body, some electricity in your body, come on, anybody know that name of Jesus? That's all right, we're ready to open God devotional service. I love him this afternoon. You know, one of the things that I'm so grateful about this afternoon, I was looking and praying this morning, I was looking in one of my prayer journals, and I began to think and ponder, I'm like, wow, sometimes we write things down and we pray, and we forget what we said, and forget what we pray for, and you go back and look, and I was like, thank you, Jesus, I began to check everything God has done five years ago. And see, one of the things that sometimes things aren't in the front of our mind when we pray about them, but when we write them down, Scripture says he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. And I'm like, my God, if you just did one of these things for me, it would have been all right. You see, you see I, I thought about it. I said, you have people on the side of the road asking for money. And when that window rolls down, they don't care what comes out. They take it. But I thank God that every time he opens the windows of heaven to pour me out a blessing, to answer my prayer, I'm so grateful, I'm so glad. That's why when you see me come, I got him on my mind, I got him in my heart, I got him in my soul. He threw down like a red wall. You may be seated. This is my testimony. We got some other folk that got a testimony. Testify, Sister Dundee. God is good when? All the time. All the time, what? God is good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give an honor to God. I thank God for just being here today, minister, almost took my testimony. I'm just so grateful and thankful for just being in the truth. I thank God for this message that was this morning about truth. 
the song says God's not dead, he's still alive. That is a truth. I can feel him in my hands. I can feel him in my feet. I can feel him all over me. I thank God for just waking me up this morning, spirit on life another day. I thank God because he is such a personal God. Like a uh, minister was saying earlier, that was my testimony. You, when you get God involved throughout your day, he is just there. He is with you all the time. Every single day I get up, I'm just like, okay, God, what are we doing today? How are we going to do this today? All throughout the day, Lord, I, help me here. Lord, help me there. Lord, help me. He, when I have God involved, even if it's not even, when I ask him to do something, even if it's not the biggest thing that he does, he's always faithful. He always comes out a winner at the finishing line. It could be like, I say, okay, God, I just need this, this little bit. And he gives me that much. I say, God, I just need to uh, get the wisdom from here. And he gives me more than what I need. God is so good. He is so real. I love him all today because he is just like everything to me. He blesses me even when I don't deserve to be blessed. He is just a good, good, good God. And I love him. And I thank him. And I praise him because he is so real. Tell me what you know about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God, I just want to thank God for being here. I want to thank God for a Sunday school lesson about truth. I just thank God for being saved today, being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That is truth. I want to thank God that he's a God that never, ever failed. That is truth. I want to thank God that he's the keeper of my soul. That is truth. You know, I came to the church one night. It was a Friday night. I was 18 years old, and my heart was not right, but something got a hold of me. I got baptized in Jesus' name. I got filled up with God's Holy Ghost. He's resided in me, and now 45 years later, I can say he's never, ever failed me. I found a friend that spoke true in my life. I found the love of my life. I found everything in Jesus. I just thank God for being so real. I thank God that he's never lost. That's a good job. That's the vibe. Scare away. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I truly want to give honor and all the praise to the Lord. That he is an awesome God. Last Sunday, Sister Massey preached about the medication. And that's the first time that I really heard the whole medication Oh, it was awesome because God delivered me from 24 pills down to six. I am down to six, and I thank God for my doctor because when I went to her, I was on more than 24 pills, but I was on 24 pills for a little while with her. And then she starts deleting. Oh, you don't need this. This has too many side effects. You don't need this. this. She just kept going. I'm down to six. And I thank God for that. And she's working on my insulin. I was taking 24 units of insulin at night. She got me down to 12. I was taking no less. I was taking 12. I know that I'm down to 10. God is working. God is working on my life. Now I'm asking God and praying for him to deliver me from arthritis. I know it's old people get arthritis, but God is awesome. He delivered me from my knees. I have bone on bone, and my knees are great. They are awesome. Thank him 
enough and I can't thank my pastor, my sister pastor enough because the word of God is what's keeping me. That is 45 years ago, almost 46 years. Thank you, Jesus. for uh, being kept by the power of God. I thank God for having uh, a mind. I remember why I didn't have a mind to testify with boldness, with uh, assurance that God is my keeper. He's my provider. Yes, he has provided for me all the time. He's Jehovah Jireh. You know, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, any good, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk up rightly. You know what I'm saying? And then it's, it's just the power of God, how he has kept me all these years. You know, it's been four years since I've been baptized. And when I see the transformation, you know, the songwriter says, you can't tell like I can what he's done for me. Jesus in the inside, working on the outside. You know, it's not just some change. It's a great change in me. Oh, what a great change in me. I thank God. I give God glory because today, you know, is the day of my salvation. I thank God for being in church. Thank God for being kept by the power of God. How he has provided for me. I never, never have a need, you know, never have lacked uh, anything. But God has always provided, supply my needs. You know, he's, he's more than just a God that is in the Bible. I didn't know about God in the Bible. I experienced the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I have seen, I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Oh, Lord. I say, hallelujah. This is true. Reality of my life is God is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me. You know, he just don't direct me. He guides me every day. He wakes me up. He sees, he calls me his own. When I was hopeless... When I was helpless, I didn't have to look there. I didn't have to look over there. I didn't have to look my back. Not down, but I had to look up. I will lift up my eyes into the holy hill from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. My redemption comes from the Lord. My strength comes from the Lord. He is the light of my life. He is my salvation. Oh, Lord. I say hallelujah. The fire of God, yet it's inside. I got to tell you like this. Oh, God. 
your attention is first and foremost to, I think, 22nd chapter of Matthew. I really should just give an altar call according to Sister Holmes, the message she sent me. So I think that would be in order. But we're going to press the issue. <laughs> One of the things that we deal with in in belief is a lot of misconceptions. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're devious or anyone's devious, it just means that you don't have the proper or appropriate understanding. Let me give you a classic illustration. Many believe that uh, when we expire or fall asleep in Christ, that we're going to meet our deceased relatives. We're going to see Grandma, Papa. Uh, Jack Van Impey, I remember a few years ago, I think there was his cat a dog. Well, anyway, he, cat, there's a doctrine that few Christians believe that your animals that you were associated with, and they were in a safe environment when they die, and then you fall asleep or expire, you would meet them in heaven. Now, these are educated. See if you can find that little thing, Jack Van Empey. Uh, and, and it's being taught. I've always thought that uh, because I never saw any of my grandparents, any, 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 Mother's side, father's side. Uh, you see, here, see, animals in heaven, biblical proof by, J now this man is famous worldwide, by Jack Van Empey. I didn't even bother to do the research because the practicality is not there. Animals don't have souls. Uh, only mankind have souls. And then the other misconception, as I said, I was going to see my grandparents because everybody as a kid used to talk about their grandparents. I didn't know any grandparents. So I thought and I assumed that they were in heaven and I assumed that I was going to go to heaven and I was going to see my grandparents. And people to this day embrace the fact that they're going to see their loved ones. Well, I'm going to show you why that's a misconception and how unimportant that really is. I mean, it's good to think for inspiration and motivation, et cetera. But when you and I get to heaven, the total focus, our attention will be on Christ. Uh, the only reason we have relationships now is because of the bodies that we're in. Uh, we're in a male body, a female body, a child. Uh, but outside the body, it's nothing but a soul. And the different definition of a soul is really breath. Well, where do you get that from? Well, you start in Genesis. The Bible says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now, man was already formed. But breathe breath into him, and man became a living soul. That's how that occurs. Um, the Lord told Adam, dust thou art and dust thou shall return. Say, when you die physically, the body disintegrates and it turns to dust. But you or I, the person inside of this tabernacle, will live forever somewhere. We assume it is going to be heaven. 
So there was a lot of confusion back in Jesus' days 2,000 years ago when uh, they were trying to trick Jesus. It was the Sadducees, not the Pharisees, the Sadducees did not believe in angels, they did not believe in life hereafter, so they wanted to trick Jesus. And there was a law or a custom, for instance, if uh, we're going back under the Old Testament, if I had a brother, Old Testament, Old Testament, if uh, my brother and I, and I married and I died prematurely to birthing a child, it was the obligation of the duty of the next son to marry uh, his brother's uh, former wife and procreate or have a child, and the child would be named in honor of, of the, of the f our father, the brother. And so this was a long-standing thing going back to the Old Testament. It does not apply today. So the Sadducees decided they're going to trick Jesus. So let's pick it up. Did I say 20? I meant 19. Did I said no, no, 18. Um, See, you know, I just put my glasses on, so what can you say? Blame me on that. You're right. I said, I'm, I'm all messed up. Is that you, Brother Robert, helping me? I said 22. That's just like Jamie messed me up and Kiki messed me up on Friday. How many of you know they messed me up? And none of you said anything. I said, this looks familiar. I said, I, I, I knew I went to the 20th chapter of, uh, of Revelation. I said, I haven't been there. Jamie said, no, no, sir, no, sir. <laughs> Kiki, no, 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 no. I said, I feel funny. But nobody helped me. No one helped me. All, all of you just let me drown. <laughs> all right, let's pick it up here. Uh, uh, verse 22. Verse 23, the same day came him to the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said if a man died having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were, uh, now this is, this is just a phenomenal thing, the worst possible scenario the most unlikely and possible thing is going to happen. Now there was, was with us seven brethren, and the first which he had married a wife, uh, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third even to the seventh. So there were seven brothers, so each one kept dying. Did not produce a seed. And last of all, the woman also died also. Therefore, uh, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. So we got him now. Uh, said, there's a marriage in heaven. Or relationships in heaven. And look what Jesus responds and say in verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto him, ye do mess up terribly you do error not knowing the scriptures so you don't understand the scriptures nor the power of God for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven huh. they ain't Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. No marriage. You're going to see no husband. You're going to see no wife. Uh, verse 1. Chapter 1, I'm sorry. As the angels. Verse 7. And the angels, we say, who maketh his angels spirits and ministers the flame of fire. 
said, uh, the, the, the spirits. Look in uh, verse number, I'm skipping a lot, verse number 14. Are not, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to help, to aid, minister for them that are heirs of salvation? Say, angels are created for this particular problem to help us, to aid us, to guide us, uh, to put a hedge around us, say the, the angels are. Well, question we've got to ask ourselves. Let's look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 14. Say, so they're, they're spirits. Now, what are you and I going to be when we die? Well, we shouldn't say die. We, we transition, fall asleep in Christ. What are you and I going? No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting all messed up. 7, 4, 15, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, we are souls. We're living souls right now. We're alive. Verse number 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Now, this is figurative, figuratively. Uh, and the last Adam, meaning Christ, was made a quickening spirit. The scripture says, we shall be like him, we shall be like him, a quickening spirit, for we shall see him as he is. So the form that we have now, we will not have. Let's go to verse 51. You, you see this physical form? We're not going to have that. Verse 51. Behold, I show you, you don't understand, in a mystery, we shall not all die asleep, but we shall be transitioned or transformed, change. Say, in, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when Corruption, when this corruptible, that means you die, you disintegrate, would have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So those of us that are alive when Jesus comes, Scripture says, O grave, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now, having said that, uh, I want to establish the fact, the importance of having a spiritual relationship. See, if you and I are going to have a relationship with God, it's not going to be a physical relationship. We have physical relationships and biological relationships with each other. It has to be spiritual. Turn with me to... Revelation chapter 3. So what dominates, or should I say, what is characteristic of our relationship with God is that it is spiritual. You and I will never have the desire, a hopeful relationship with God unless we do something with our minds. Let me hold that. Turn with me to the 8th chapter of Romans. This is why intellectually you'll never be able to serve God. Uh, it, it, there is no logic to it. It is a spiritual manifestation. Verse... Let's go to verse 5. For they that after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh that prioritize biological... But they that after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life. Then becomes the struggle, the difficulty. We live in a fleshly body. We have fleshly appetites and desires. 
We have the attraction of the world that is for the fleshly appetite, and yet we expect to have a spiritual mind. That's a fight. That's a struggle. It's ongoing. And the first thing that Jesus tells us to even begin to win this war is that we must not prioritize what I want or what you want. He said, if any man will come after me, let him say, whatever priorities I once have had are no longer high on the totem pole. What I have to do is that I have to crush my fleshly appetites. It is a constant battle because the flesh wants, wants, and wants, and wants. The flesh is attracted to the things in the world. That's why the devil uses them to tempt us, because there's an attraction. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there is the, the, the challenge to be transformed, not to let the earthly, fleshly appetites dominate us, but, but cause them to, let, let's say, keep them in check. You say, well, I want to, listen, I want this, I want that. It's natural. Well, Paul talks about it. He said, well, he said, uh, I keep under my body. I bring it into subjection. It means I make it, it has appetites. It wants this, it wants that, it wants the lust. So I, I must make my body my slave. I cannot allow my body to be my master. Then becomes the fight. In the third chapter of Revelation, uh, Laodicean, you know where I'm going, it shows you the violation of a commandment and a trust that God gave to the church. God trusts that if we had the opportunity to change for the better, getting saved is for the better, not the worse. He trusts that if we were liberated, that we would show our gratitude and appreciate it, and we would not do the proverb that is in the scripture says, the dog has turned back to his own vomit. It's a proverb, it's a saying in the scripture. Said of everything that made the dog, the dog regurgitated and threw up, say he's licking it up again. That's what it means to get saved and then to go back. To have your hands through the plow looking back. He trusted us that once, uh, no, no, the bondage rather was sexual, alcohol, drugs, uh, whatever it is, the hatred, animosity, say, whatever had us in bondage, once we were liberated, God trusted us that we would not turn back again. The biggest thing that all of us have to deal with at one time or another until it becomes a victory in our lives is money. Money. Solomon, in his older age, when he was backsliding, he wrote in Ecclesiastic, money answers all things. But you got to look at the context that he said that. And it is believed and uh, it is conceived in the minds that money can buy love, can buy affection, can buy loyalty, can buy trust, it can buy happiness. And uh, the evidence is worldwide. Can't buy anything but infatuation and temporariness. Yeah, you get your look, country western song, my father in law used to call it. Wrap your troubles in dreams and dream your troubles away. But when you wake up, you still have to face reality. The appetites of the flesh. So, 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 so money makes people feel invincible. 
Sixth chapter, hold this and come back. Sixth chapter, Matthew. Come right back now. Sixth chapter. Money is a tyrant. It's a master. It controls people. Kill. I remember I was in Philadelphia. I was a little kid. Um, 50s. You had to be in the 50s. And these two men were arguing over a penny. And the other one shot and killed him. Uh, it wasn't the money, because you can't buy a lot with a penny, even back in the 50s. But it was based on principle. Well, well, I mean, you, you're, going, you're going to fight over, over, over a penny? You're going to kill someone? Was it because of the value of that? No. Devil got him on principles. Most of the battles that we, we lose is based on principle. Give me an example. Someone says something to you uh, in a relationship, uh, the immediate response or inclination, uh, whether it hurts you or not, is, is the principle. Who are you to say that to me, etc.? So you get angry over the principle. Not that the words actually hurt you, uh, but it was a principle. Who are you to say that to me? Who do you think you are? Principle. Uh, money becomes a principle instrument in the hands of those that have not been converted. So what do you mean, Pastor? Not saved. See, when we're saved, Jesus is everything. He, he's not some things, but he is the woman that had two mites, a farling, Jesus said that she gave, this poor widow gave more than all those that were wealthy into the offering. Uh, why? He said because she gave everything that she had. And so when Jesus was adding up uh, uh, how many dollars that they were putting in the offering, and, and he, he combined it, say, so put it all together, enumerate it, tabulate it, Say, but them little two mites is greater in God's eyesight. She said, they gave out of their abundance. She gave out of all her living she had. She had nothing left. That's how God uh, tabulates things. Well, here in verse number 24, if you please. Ye cannot serve to... Listen. You know, people break up, fight, relationships over money. Uh, said, again, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Impossible. It is impossible. You cannot serve God. And mammon. Hmm. Mammon is material wealth that has a debasing influence. And it was it changes your old, whole character. The scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil, God and mammon. So the church back in the third chapter of Revelation had a problem. They did not heed the warning. So it went forth to sow some seed. Uh, some fell by the wayside, for some fell on stony grounds, some fell among thorns. In fact, we better look at that. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, I want you to see it. Matthew chapter 13. Now everybody taking this in, right? Yeah. So next time money come your way, kick it. <laughs> So you won't deceive me. Is that what you're going to tell money? No, say, look, money, no deception here. Uh, wait a minute. No, no, no. Let me go. Uh, let me go to Mark. I like his version of it. Mark chapter four. Yeah, let's let's go to Mark. I, I want his version of this. Now I'm gonna read quickly. Verse thirteen. 
he said unto them, Know ye not the parable, then how shall ye not know all parables? The, the sower soweth the seed. These are they that fell by the wayside, where the word is sown. And when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and take away the word that was sown in their hearts. So they reject it. These are they likewise which sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Say, say, say to get saved, they're in the church, but no depth. And have no root in themselves, but hang in there, so endure, but for a time afterward when affliction or uh -oh, persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are, say, I can't handle this. And these are they which are sown among, watch these thorns, such as hear the word, and the anxieties, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness. A, a, a stimulus check will make you deceitful. you hit that more in a minute. <laughs> the deceitfulness of riches and the lust, I got a little bit of money, of other things, endure, uh, enter in, and what strangle, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. The problem with this in the fifth, no turn, 55th chapter of Isaiah, God says, my word shall not return unto me. Boy, third chapter of Revelation. So this church, the church age that we're living in, we are the candlestick. This is an actual church that existed 2,000, uh, let's say almost 2,000 years ago. And we are living the characteristics of this church where this is the church age where the church folks uh, no longer look down on reproach as being poor people. But it's about wealth, get your money, get your stuff. And so here is the, what we call the indictment. So here's the warrant. Uh, let's 14, because everybody isn't familiar with this. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, these things saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou neither cold nor hot, or wood, that thou would cold or hot. So then because thou are you, you, distinction, you're not cold, you're not hot. Ice glass of water, glass of water, filled with ice. Uh, a, a cup, uh, a, a mug, hot as substance you want. Take both of them, leave them in this room or any other room. Guess what happens? They both will get luke. The cold will get lukewarm and the hot will get lukewarm. They will adjust to their environment. They will adapt to their environment. So this is what is happening. Uh, Laodicea was a wealthy, they had banks, it was a great trade route. Uh, it was for the entrepreneurs, a uh, great place for the worldly. So this affected the church. Let's go down to verse 16. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This is Jesus. Because your mentality, your lifestyle, because thou sayest I am rich and increase with good the deceitfulness of riches, and I don't need God. And we're talking about an attitude. We're talking about a disposition. We're talking about a mentality. That's why we can go without praying, go without coming to church, go without reading the scriptures, etc. because we feel invincible that we don't need God yet, but when there is a crisis, or we reach the point of desperation, now we need him. But as long as I can manage life, I, mean, I don't really need God. God just an option. Attitude, disposition, mentality. Because thou sayest, I am rich in increase of goods and have need of nothing. Say, but you don't know that you are wretched, that you are miserable, you are poor. Wait a minute, you have riches, but poor what? God has chosen 
the poor of this world, what? So they had everything else but, but faith. And the scripture says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Blind, can't see, and see that word naked. We have to zero in on that word naked. Now here's the advice, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, which symbolizes faith, that thou mayest be rich, not rich in materialism, but in faith. And see this, uh, verse 17 says naked, and white raiment, and white raiment, remember the phrase, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou may have seen. They were famous for this eye salve that had these healing properties in it. Say, but, but, but your, your garment is white. So if it's not white, it means that it is stained. And keep that in mind. So here is the action. As many as I love, I rebuke and whip you. God said, because I love you, he said, I'm going to whip you. As many as I love, and I rebuke and chasten. Say, now be quick. The more you sow, the more you're going to have to reap. Be quick, be zealous, therefore, and repent. He said, Behold, I'm available. The Lord said, I'm making myself available. I stand at the door and knock on the door of your heart. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and sup with him, and he with me. Now let's go to the seventh chapter of Revelation. White raiment. So now we're going to appear in heaven. Flesh, mortality, corruption cannot go to heaven. The mere fact, uh, Daniel, John, those that were in the presence of God, scripture said they fell down on earth as though they were dead. So you can't get up there. Here, uh, John is getting a vision, and one of the elders asked him a question when, let's pick it up in verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, and no man could number in all, all the nations, all the kindreds, and all the people, not all the races, and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Stay with me. And they cried, this is in heaven, a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, we're in heaven, and about the elders and four beasts, these four special angels called beasts, fell before the throne in their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory, Wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power might be unto our God forever. Amen. And one of the elders, now, this is a revelation given to John who's writing the book of Revelation. And one of the elders said to me, Sir, I'm, I'm sorry. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in what? White robes. And where did they come from? Now wait a minute, let's go back to verse 9. Who are they? After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, impossible. No man could number of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. All right, let's go back to verse 13. He said, where did they come from? Verse 14, and I, and I said, John said, I said, sir, thou knowest. He said to me, these are they which came out of great trouble, tribulation, and have washed their robes, garments, robes, and made them, here we go again, white in the blood of the Lamb. That your raiment might be white. 
And here it says, and therefore they are before the throne of God that is in heaven. Serve him day and night. Now day and night means eternity. In his temple, and you see that word temple, immediately people say, oh, there's going to be a temple in heaven. For three and a half years, Jesus established that his body was the temple. And then, know ye not that your bodies, 1 Corinthians 7, is the temple of God? So they look at this and think this is a physical temple. No. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Now wait a minute. He's sitting on the throne. He, not them, but one. He's, and, he, and, he, and he dwells among them. Uh, they surround him. He's, he, he, he has immersed, immersed himself in them. Now stay with me here. The life. They shall hunger no more. Why? Because you don't have this body. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst, they don't have this body, neither shall the sun affect them, uh, uh, any heat, anything adverse will have no effect on them. For the lamb, who is the lamb please? Jesus. Which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Say, so, wait a minute, no water, no thirst, no hunger, but he's going to feed them. What he's going to feed them with? Exactly what Job says. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my... How many are you familiar with that? Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. The proceeding by the mouth of God. That's what he's going to feed them with. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. Now, now stay with me then. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to come back. I'm going to talk to you a little bit here. Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who is God? Who is the Holy Ghost? Now, now look what happens here. Now this is talking about Jesus. Verse number 24. Then cometh the, what's that? The end. When he, Jesus, should have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority with power. And this is the end. He must reign forever. It says forever. He must reign till or until specific time. Until it says he must reign till he had put down all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall never affect mankind that shall be destroyed, no more dying, death. Now please look at this. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under his feet, is a man manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued to him, then he must reign till he must reign till then shall the son, who's the son? Jesus. Himself be subject unto him, who's him? God, that put all things under him, that God, no mother, no father, no sister, no brother, no children, that God may be everything in all, all, all. He's everything that we ever need. Yes. Let's look at it again. 
And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject to him. This is the end. That put all things under him, that God may be everything. So when you get to heaven, God is everything to everybody at the same time because we will be like we'll be what we'll, we won't look like this but we will be like him we won't be old we won't be young we will be like him because God will be all in all oh, turn back with me to the Revelation chapter 7. I almost finished. Verse 17 now. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and lead them unto living fountains of water. It's, it's, it's a term. And God shall whatever causes grief, mourning, or tears. And talking about those in heaven, God shall wipe away all their tears from life. So whatever circumstances, issues producing tears won't exist. You, you won't be able to cry. You won't know what crying is. This is why Paul says, I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the so there's no explanation for it. So all we can do is that it eliminated every hardship that we ever had and it increased the relationship, uh, should I say, we, we would have immersed ourselves in Christ. And this is very important that God might be all in all. And when we get to heaven, we will emerge. There's a difference between immerse and emerge. Uh, if, if, if you're swimming, you're underwater, you're drowning, some forth, and you come, oh, he has emerged. We are a city that is set on a hill that must emerge. Uh, you do not light a candle and put it under a bush. You got to take that candle. It must emerge to be that light that is set on a hill. But, but in the meantime, we must immerse ourselves in Christ. How do we do that? I have suffered the loss of all things, but do count them, but that I might win Christ. Uh, said, uh, whatever is necessary for me to immerse myself in uh, we sing a song that talks about immersed, wrapped up, tied up, all tangled up in Jesus. Turn with me to chapter 20 and we finish. Wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. You have immersed yourself. Now, I'm going to shorten this here. Verse 3. Now, this is eternity. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. Uh, look at God himself. God himself shall be with them and be their God. God himself. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more death. We won't know, we'll know what sorrow is, neither sorrow, nor crying that there's no need, no condition or circumstance that would, be, that would produce a tear. There'd be no tears in heaven. Crying. Neither shall there be any more mental, physical, psychological, no more pain. 
Now, now do we believe this? Amen. For everything that existed in the past, the former things are what? So what about the memories? What about the feelings? What about the experiences? It's all gone. Because God will be all in all. And this is why Friday said, whosoever loveth mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife more than me is not worthy of me uh, because God wants to be, has to be everything to us. Amen. Nothing rivals God. Uh, people have testified. Uh, uh, see, God doesn't replace a mother, father, son, or daughter, etc., like he did in the Old Testament. What he has given us when we got saved transcends everything. Uh, there, there, there is nothing greater that God can give to us than to give himself. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It's a gift. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when we shall see him, he shall appear. We shall be like. Now, they say I look like my father. Mother used to tell me I act like my father. But we shall be like him. All earthly identities would have vanished because God will be all. Now, what does that mean? God is all in all. It challenges us. It should inspire us because Jesus said, God is a spirit. spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in for the Father's seek of such to. So what does it mean to be immersed in God which is a spirit? I'll tell you what it is. We become a quickening spirit because we become like him. So the emphasis that the world causes us to put on earthly things is really inconsequential if you make a comparison. Let me give, tell you about that statement. Let's say you and I are the most successful person in the world. We become a tyrant. We own the world. Everything is at our disposal. People at our disposal. Uh, we're the king of the earth. So Jesus makes a comparison between one soul that is on his way to hell. The scripture says, what does it profit a man, Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains? There is no greater success than the whole world. Everything that mankind would hope to achieve is contained in the world. Jesus, now wait a minute, I'm going to show you how important you are. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his soul that is going to hell? He said, now wait a minute, if you lost your soul, can you ransom or can you buy back your soul? He said, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer is nothing. You and I don't care how you feel or that you make yourself feel a priceless. Priceless in God's eyesight. Uh, in, in spite of you being down on yourself, you're nothing and nobody. That might be true, but that's not God's opinion of you. Nobody loves me. That's not true. Nobody understands. That's not true. If no one loves you, God does. And in spite of what we are, we aren't. Scripture says, God so loved everybody in the world that he gave himself his only begotten son that all you have to do is do what? All we have to do? You want to change? You want to improve? You want to be a better version of yourself? Only Somebody help me now. That's all. Don't think about it. All things. All things. Are possible. Give
give it to God. Sing it, children. What do you have to do? have to do? What do I have to do to change? Will you let God change you on his terms? I believe.
scriptures there. I'm going to ask all of us to have a spirit of repentance. Uh, re repentance means, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you did anything bad, but I didn't do what I should do because the scripture says unto him that knoweth to do good and to him that doeth not what? Amen. So congregationally, I want you to close your eyes and repeat after me. Search me, O oh God, God, and know my heart. And know my heart. Try, me, Try me, and know my thoughts. And know my thoughts. See, if See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Forgive, Forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my trespasses. And forgive me of all my iniquities. Create within me a clean heart and renew a, a right spirit. Let that mind dwell in me that was also in Christ Jesus. Deliver me from the power of Satan to the glorious power of Christ. Cover me under the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name. One stanza. I need Everybody.
told you what God has done. Is that seven-year-old kid here? What seven-year-old boy? Did he, did he make it, the seven-year-old kid that wanted to get baptized? Uh oh. He's here? Now listen, this is special. Uh, for two weeks, it's been two weeks now, this little, two weeks, he's been one. No kid, uh, I, I, I read about it in history where there have been few kids, few far in between at six and seven years old that want to get baptized and convert their lives. For two weeks now, he's been wanting to get baptized, seven years old. Immediately I thought about that when I heard, I said, ooh, this is God. Uh, no, no seven-year-old kid don't think like that. And, and he was just insistent. It's got to be, it's got to be. So if God is doing something special like that, and there's no respect to person. If you need something special, uh, what was that song, uh, the, uh, Lord, if you're going to heal somebody, if you're going to bless somebody, don't do it with, without me. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Let us pray. Father, Lord, in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, you are a miracle-working God. Miracle. Somebody needs a miracle. Hallelujah. Lord, for your name's sake, not because we deserve or merit anything, but because you're so compassionate. For your name's sake, Lord, miracles. Miracles. Manifest ourselves. Healings. Deliverance. In the name of Jesus, manifest yourself as we agree together congregationally. We believe that what your word says where two or three are in the midst of, where two or three are gathered together, I am in the midst of them. You're right here. Now, Lord, our faith reaches out unto me. The word of faith in our hearts and in our mouth. Lord, we believe. We believe for your goodness, for a miracle. Glory! Give our minds, our souls, and our bodies. We know that you're doing something in our midst because you said, no man can come unto me except the spirit of my father draws him. Help us to believe and not to worry about understanding because we know that all things are working together for good. These souls that are going down, let them feel the cleansing power. Glory! Lord, and those of us that are struggling right now, strengthen in the name of Jesus Christ. Strengthen in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray for victory. We claim victory in the name of Jesus Christ. For your word says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And our faith looks up unto thee. Now, Lord, because you are a prayer-answering God, we thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to do. Glory! 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 Hallelujah! Glory! Glory! We thank you. You know that one day, one day in your own time, you will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thank you for keeping us from the hour of bereavement. Save our loved ones. Glory! Most importantly, Lord, keep us from the wiles of the adversary. Bless our people wherever they gather one by one. We give your name all the honor. All the praise, all the glory, in Jesus' name, glory, amen.